This video is part of an online course on rings and modules and we'll give a few more miscellaneous examples of rings. So the first example is the Burnside ring. So the Burnside ring actually depends on a group, um, usually a finite group, and what we do is we look at all actions of G on finite sets. Um, this is optoisomorphism, and we can almost form these into a ring. So, so it's almost a ring. And let's see how we define addition and multiplication on this. So the addition is going to be disjoint union. So if we've got sets S and T acted on by the group G, we can just take the disjoint union of S and T and think of that as being the sum. Um, multiplication is going to be the product of two sets. So we take sets S times T and G obviously acts on that. And zero is obviously going to be the empty set. And the unit of the ring is going to be the one point set acted on trivially by G. And it's not too difficult to check that this satisfies almost all the axioms of a ring. It's associative and distributive and whatever. Um, there's one little problem. There's no subtraction in general. So, um, you know, if you've got two finite sets, there's no sensible way to subtract one from the other in general. I mean, you, you can sometimes sort of subtract them, but um, not always. Um, well, anyway, uh, let's not worry about that for the moment and just take a look at what this ring actually looks like. What we're going to do is to take G to be the symmetric group S3, just as an example. Let's work out what this thing that isn't quite a ring looks like. Well, um, any action of G on S um, can be split up as a union of transitive actions. because we can just decompose S into its orbits under G and each of those um, will be a transitive action on G. And transitive actions correspond to subgroups of G. Well, they, they don't quite. They correspond to subgroups of G optoconjugacy. Um, so, um, um, so G has essentially four different sorts of subgroup. Actually, it's got more than that, but some of these subgroups are conjugate, so that doesn't really count. So, um, um, so, so we, we can have an action of G on, well, we could have one element or two elements or three elements or six elements, because we know that G has four different types of subgroup with well, one of these types. There are three subgroups. So this is going to be the trivial action on a one element set. This is going to be the regular action of G on itself. And this is going to be the action of G on the points of a triangle. Um, so it acts on the three points of a triangle. And then this is, uh, I guess it, you, you, you could call it the, the, the sort of sine action. Um, so if, if G acts on the polynomial x1 minus x2, x1 minus x3, x2 minus x3, it changes this polynomial either to delta or minus delta, so it's acting on this two-point set of delta and minus delta. So um, what the ring, or what, what the thing that isn't quite a ring consists of is all things A times um, the action on one set plus B times the action on this set of two elements plus C times the action on a set of three elements plus D times uh, uh, the action on a set of six elements. Here I'm, I'm writing three with a circle around to mean the, the sort of three-point set actually on by G in this way and so on. Here A, B, C and D are integers that are greater than or equal to zero because obviously you can't have minus one times a set with three elements and that's not a set. Um, for example, let's try working out what the multiplication in this ring is. So what is what is 3 times 3? Well, what you do is you take a 3-element set acted on by G 
and you take another three elements set acted on by G in the usual way and you take the product of these so you get nine elements and we need to know how G is acting on these nine elements. So, so um, let, let's, let's look at two elements of G. So we're acting on a suppose we're acting on a three element set and we label the points as A, B, C. Then, then we have one element of G might swap A and B say um, and um, on, on these three elements it will swap these two elements and on this set of three it will swap these two elements. So if you work out what it, what's happening on this nine point set it sort of does this. It takes this element to itself. On the other hand we can look at the um, another action on the three point set. It might swap these two elements and similarly what it does is this. Um, it swaps these two and these two and maps this point to itself. And now if you look at this it, we, we've got an action of S3 on this set of nine points and you notice immediately that there are two orbits. The first orbit is the diagonal which is the usual action on three points and the other orbit is this sort of cycle of um, six points like this and this is obviously just the, 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 the regular representation on six points because that's the only transitive action on six points. So we've worked out what a product of two elements in this ring is. We see that three times three is equal to three plus six. And similarly if you want you can work out the product of any other two elements. Quite similar to this. Um, so um, We've got a perfectly explicit thing that isn't quite a ring and it's pretty obvious how we can turn it into a ring. So, so to turn it into a ring we just take all formal expressions a1 plus b2 plus c3 plus d6 where now we allow a, b, c and d to be any integers. So they, we now allow a, b, c and d to be negative and the multiplication of two expressions like this is just defined in the obvious way. We just keep the same product of these four basis elements and it's not difficult to check it. we get a ring. So this is called the Burnside ring of S3 and it's pretty obvious you can do something similar for um, any other finite group. Um, notice this operation of going from this thing that isn't quite a ring to a ring by forcibly introducing negative elements is, like, is a bit like the construction where you start with the positive integers 0, 1, 2 and so on and go to the integers uh, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2 and so on. You, you, you remember there's a construction where you sort of forcibly add um, the, the negative of, of elements in order to get a ring. Um, this is actually a rather general construction. If, if we've got some sort of semi-group um, X, we can get a group out of it by just sort of forcibly adding inverses of elements. Um, in general you've got to be a little bit careful because the map from the semi-group to the corresponding group might not actually be injective. For instance if the semi-group is two elements A not equal to B but we've got elements A plus C equals B plus C. Um, this implies the images of A and B must be the same in the group G. Um, this sort of phenomenon actually happens um, fairly often. This is sometimes called the Grothendieck group. Um, Grothendieck sort of introduced it when defining K-theory of, of algebraic varieties. Um, it's a bit strange to have a construction that's fairly simple named after Grothendieck who invented some of the most complicated um, objects in mathematics but whatever. Um, so, um, so we've got this um, functor which takes, so, so we've got this map which takes um, groups to rings. Um, it's actually a functor. Suppose we've got groups G and H and a map from G to H. Then we can um, look at the Burnside ring of G and the Burnside ring of H. 
and there's a morphism between them, you've got to be a little bit careful because it actually goes in the wrong direction. Like if you've got H acting on a set, then by composition with this, we also get G acting on a set. So we actually get um, map from the Burnside ring of H to the Burnside ring of G. So, so it's actually a contravariant functor. Um, for example, um, if, we t if we take the map 1, the trivial group goes to S3, we get a map from the Burnside ring of S3 to the Burnside ring of 1, which is just the integers. And it's pretty obvious what this map does, is it, is it just takes the basis element n for n equals 1, 2, 3, or 6 to the number n, which is why I called it n. Um, th th there's another variation of this called the representation ring of G. It's kind of similar except instead of looking at the action of G on finite sets, we look at the action of G on, say, complex vector spaces. And um, it turns out that at least if G is finite, any complex vector space can be written as a sum of irreducible representations of G, meaning you can't decompose them any further, in the same way that any set acted on by G can be written as a union of transitive orbits. And again, we find we can put a ring structure on this. The addition is addition of vector spaces. The tensor product is tensor product of vector spaces, which we haven't covered yet, which is one reason I'm not doing this in detail. Um, um, so the next example of a ring I want to discuss is the ring of differential operators. And there are lots and lots of variations of this. I'm going to do this one of the simplest examples. Let's just look at differential operators on the real line. And I'm going to take differential operators with polynomial coefficients. Um, and what this, this ring contains it contains two obvious elements. It contains x and it contains a differential operator d, which I'm going to um, write for differentiation. I'm not going to write it as d by dx for a reason that will become obvious in a moment. So um, our differential operators are going to be polynomials over the reals in these two elements x and d. But we've got to be a bit careful because xd is not equal to dx. In fact, dx is equal to x d plus 1. And if you think about it, this is just Leibniz's rule for differentiation. If I apply dx to a function f, this is d by dx of xf, which is um, df over dx plus um, um, so it's x df by dx plus um, plus f. Um, and the reason I'm not I'm, I'm writing a capital D rather than d by dx is if you write d by dx of x, it's kind of unclear whether you're applying the differential operator to the function x or whether you're composing the differential operator d by dx with the function of multiplying by x. So, so this is kind of ambiguous. Um, anyway, so we've got a sort of polynomial ring, except the generators of the polynomial ring don't quite commute. Um, but you can sort of use this to bring all the, all the um, x's to the left. So this actually has a basis of things of the form x to the m, d to the n for m, n greater than or equal to zero. So it's about the same size as a polynomial ring in two variables, except that the, the two generators don't commute. Um, you can, of course, do this in several variables. You could take three variables x, y, z, and d by dx, d by dy, d by dz as your operators. And then you notice that, for example, x d by dy commutes with d by dy with x, but x and d by dx don't quite commute. So it looks a bit like a polynomial ring in six generators, except it's not, not quite commutative. Um, and what you can do is you can sort of turn differential equations into modules 
over this ring. So let's see, see how this works. Suppose we take a, a differential operator and let's make it homogeneous and linear just to make things easy. So we could take x squared d squared by dx squared plus x d by dx plus x squared minus alpha squared. So this is um, basically Bessel's equation. If you apply this operator to a function, um, you get Bessel's differential equation. So, you, so if E is this differential operator, you're trying to solve E of Y equals zero, where Y is some function on the reals. And if you can find a solution to that, that will be a Bessel function. Um, so um, um, what we're going to do is, is, is if we let R be the ring of differential operators um, over over the reals. Here I'm using R for a ring of differential operators and R for the real numbers, so you have to keep alert about which is which. And then you can form the module. You can take the ring of differential operators and you can quotient it out by the left ideal generated by this operator here. So this is a, a left module because we've taken copy of R and we're quotienting it out by a left ideal. And now if we let M be the smooth functions on, on the real line, say, then M is also a module over the, over the ring R because you can apply a differential operator to a smooth function. And now let's think what a solution to this differential equation is. Well, um, we can define a homomorphism of um, we, we, we can define a map from from R to M just by taking any element E to E of F where F is going to be some function in M. Um, and if F is a solution of this equation, then this ideal here just maps to zero. So we find that maps from R over um, um, RE, where E is this differential operator here, maps from RE to M correspond to solutions of Bessel's equation. So a differential equation becomes a module over this ring and a solution to the differential equation becomes a homomorphism of modules, homomorphism of left modules. And now if you want you can start applying lots of ring theory to this. I mean if you've got a homomorphism between modules you can, I don't know, maybe start doing homological algebra and ask what the homology groups of this are and so on. Um, one application of this is um, the construction of the bernstein sato polynomial of a differential operator where you use the theory of modules over this ring in order to construct the bernstein sato polynomial. So I, I've got another lecture on that if you want to look it up. Okay, I think that'll be enough examples of rings for the moment. And next lecture will be more on ring theory.